this book has gotten a lot of attention. Um, and those of you who are my age, and I see there are a few of you, uh, you know, uh, here who have reached that exalted age, will remember this from the original Kitty Genovese uh, murder story, um, and how powerful it was at the time, and has remained uh, ever since. And this is one of those, we know at the Kansas City Public Library that true crime sells. Well, this is untrue crime night uh, at the library because Kevin Cook is here to tell you what really happened, and it's different than the story we were told uh, at the time, and he's going to name the uh, perpetrators of the, of the false information. Um, uh, Kevin comes with an interesting background for, for doing this. His previous books uh, have been mostly about uh, really interesting sports figures. Titanic Thompson, uh, the, the sports better uh, extraordinaire uh, Damon Runyon-esque uh, character who in fact is the basis for Damon Runyon's uh, uh, Sky Masterson uh, in, in Guys and Dolls. Uh, but it was based on a real guy, Titanic Thompson. And, and Tom Morris and Tom Morris, father and son, uh, two great Scottish golfers who, uh, who helped uh, invent the modern game of, of golf and had a fascinating personal story. Um, a book about the, uh, the NFL in the 70s, et cetera, and a book that, uh, that you can find on eBay, it's so rare, only on eBay, about Flip Wilson. Um, who was not a sports figure, by the way, but you'd have to read the book to find out what he did in the 70s. Um, so he has a, 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 an unusual background to have written this story, but it is a really dramatic story that he tells in a very, very uh, dramatic way. As I say, it's a true crime, but an untrue crime, because the story that Kevin Cook will, will tell tonight is about how a New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and then editor, a man who became one of the most powerful editors and figures in journalism uh, in America, uh, created this story uh, off of a lunch that he had with the, the, the police commissioner. Um, the influence of that story has led to a lot of good things, as again, uh, Kevin Cook will, will tell us tonight, things like 911. Um, are at least partly a result of the Kitty Genovese story as told in 1964. Um, it's also led to a generation of psychologists and sociologists and moralists getting a story about America wrong, um, about our apathy, what's called the bystander effect. Uh, there's a great chapter uh, on psychologists and sociologists uh, and their, and their uh, not very well thought out experiments on us. Uh, to prove uh, the, the bystander effect, the apathy of modern America. I can remember, Kevin actually, I don't think has, has read this, but I remember, I think on the 10th anniversary of the Kitty Genovese murder, uh, uh, Margaret Mead wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times in which she said this was a revelation. 1974 is right, right about that moment in the mid-70s to late 70s when we re reached the depths of our crime problem and you know, the murder, number of murders in New York, et cetera. Um, and uh, she, she said it was because of our comic book hero syndrome um, and television uh, was responsible for this because we were all being taught to be passive spectators um, and let some superhero come in and save the day for us, which in fact is not at all what happened uh, in the Kitty, G Kitty Genovese uh, murder, and I, I, will, I will let Kevin Cook uh, tell it. But I think his, his book is, a, is a, 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 a really good example of how we're always looking for something other than the obvious commonsensical answer to something. We look for some huge social issue to be behind what, as the story he tells, is really a result of some people, he'll tell you how many, who could have made a difference, who made a very explicit choice not to make a difference, and some other people in this story who in fact tried. Um, though they were left out of the story as it came down to us. And then at the very end of the book, and again, I won't tell the story, I'll let him, him tell the story, but at the very end of the book, there's a kind of surprising hero uh, to this story. Um, anyway, it is, it is a page-turning book uh, and a story that has real resonance for our time, and it's uh, very ably told by Kevin Cook. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Crosby for that eloquent introduction and uh, to everyone that I've met here at uh, 
at the Kansas City Public Library. He's been uh, enthusiastic and efficient. They have actually read the book, which is always refreshing uh, when you go out and talk about uh, your book. Um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, this, this beautiful building in a uh, thriving part of a city that I didn't know very well. I haven't been here for quite a few years. I think at, at the age of like 25, I blew through town trying to drive somewhere else at 95 miles an hour and, uh, and remember a few buildings going by. No idea that, uh, that the city is as, as striking architecturally as it is. Um, the weather is 30 degrees better than it was when I uh, left home uh, yesterday. Um, it's been uh, truly a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, my, uh, my memory, I mean, when I grew up, I remember thinking of Kansas City, associating Kansas City with uh, George Brett and the Royals. The, uh, yes, the, the class of the American League. Uh, and uh, of course, it's been a while, but now they are on the brink of a contending season. Uh, that should be, it should be a remarkable season. I actually have children who are Yankees fans. Um, and um, so they've, they've been a little spoiled, but, uh, but they're very concerned about a possible American League Championship Series uh, with the Royals. Um, I've been so pleased to come here and talk about this, this story that fascinates me and it represents two years of my life. And I, I, I thank you all for coming out. It's just a, a pleasure to see such a, a good-sized group of people who, who came to hear about something that potentially is such a, a grim tale of uh, one of the grimmest and most notorious crimes in recent uh, modern American history. And while the central event is grim and, and sad and one of the most horrible experiences you might mention, and there is a darkness that hangs over the story at all times, it's not total darkness. There is. Uh, uh, certainly a detective story, which I found fascinating, is try to find out what actually happened 50 years ago this month. In fact, the 50th anniversary of the crime is the day after tomorrow. Uh, what really happened, it's also a chance to write about a remarkable time. 1964 in New York City is not only a, a dark, edgy time in America, uh, only months after the Kennedy assassination, a time when people are starting to worry this is an explanation to some degree, as I think, to why the story stuck so much. To worry about where we were going, what kind of a society we were at that time. And a good part of that was worrying about urban America. Are, are we being dehumanized? Are urban Americans starting to become the kind of people who don't know their neighbors' names, wouldn't lift a finger to help their neighbors? Um, I think those issues are important, but so are some great things that were going on in 1964. In the very time that I'm writing about, the Beatles are going from newly named John F. Kennedy Airport, blowing right through this part of Queens on their way to the Ed Sullivan Show. And they're going to take over America. The 1964-65 World's Fair is just going up uh, about five minutes from the crime scene, just north of there in, uh, in Queens. Um, at, interestingly enough, for people with the literary bent, uh, the World's Fair, which is now where the Mets play in City Field and uh, not far from LaGuardia Airport, that is the site of the ash dump that F. Scott Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby called the Valley of Ashes. That's where people would go blow through on their way to Long Island, on their way to West Egg, on your way to Gatsby's house. Uh, you pass right through that, which is then uh, cleaned out, uh, turned into uh, the World's Fair site first in 1939 and then in the 64-65 World's Fair. There is also, in this time, the chance for people who lived here to get on a train and 10 minutes later be in Manhattan and uh, just trip down the way and see uh, their, favorite, uh, their favorite folky in the middle of the folk uh, movement. The beatniks, had, beatniks were still kind of angry at the folkies who were moving in. Uh, and the folkies thought the beatniks were a thing of the past left over from the Eisenhower administration. You might think the beatniks and folkies would fight, but they would never fight. They're all, they've all got too much cannabis in, in them. Uh, they're a pretty peaceful, pretty peaceful bunch, but they argued a good deal. Uh, the folkies were uh, coming to be in charge, and um, while uh, Kitty's favorite folky was Dave Van Ronk, whose life story was loosely the, the story of Lewin Davis, the recent uh, Coen Brothers movie, 
Uh, Bob Dylan was just about, to, you could go see him. He had uh, just gotten to town and was playing at uh, Gertie's Folk City, where many nights you would see uh, Kitty Genovese and her partner. Uh, it was truly a, a remarkable time that was then marred by this amazing crime that set the city on its ear, not initially, but as soon as the New York Times got around to giving it the interpretation that's held for 50 years now. Uh, there were actually two events that go into making the 1964 murder of Kitty Genovese famous. Uh, so I, I should talk first about the crime itself. The crime happened, uh, again, it began 50 years ago tomorrow because uh, Kitty Genovese, who was a Brooklyn uh, woman, uh, charming by all accounts, hardworking, generous. Uh, she worked in a bar. She was, she was good for a few dollars if you, were, uh, if you were out of money for cab fare, if you had to have cab fare. Um, she was uh, really an independent woman at a time when uh, that was uh, even more unusual, uh, making her own way uh, in the world. She was hoping to uh, own a, a Italian restaurant of her own someday. So she worked double shifts. This is a woman who, who would tend bar for six hours and then manage the bar for the next six, which is why closing the bar at 3 a.m. Uh, on the night of March 12th, so it's early in the morning on the 13th, Friday the 13th uh, of March 1964, uh, Kitty Genovese gets into her little red Fiat and drives 15 minutes back from Hollis, where the bar she worked in was the bar was called Ev's 11th Hour. She drove back to Kew Gardens, to this neighborhood, and was locking her car at 3 a.m. This is in a neighborhood where there's very little crime. Most of the people didn't lock their cars. She was, she was particularly proud of this little red Fiat that she had. Many people in this neighborhood where uh, doors were left unlocked all night long, where Girl Scouts went and sold cookies after dark by themselves, where there hadn't been a murder in years. Uh, nobody expected any sort of crime uh, to occur. And uh, at a little after 3 a.m., right about 3.15, Kitty Genovese locked her car and walked. She parked out, as you can see, right? This is the train station. You can just see the train station back there. That's the Long Island Railroad. And that's where you're not supposed to park your car. Uh, so that's where there is a parking space available uh, if you get there at 3 a.m. and all the other parking spaces in the neighborhood are gone. Kitty took one of the uh, parking spaces where it says no parking, as the locals always did, and got away with it, uh, locked her car, and began walking. She's only taken steps when a man who has followed her, a man whose name is Winston Mosley, uh, who had chosen her at random, leaped out of his car with a hunting knife and attacked Kitty. He stabbed her in the back on the street opposite. Uh, this is the back of the building. The other side is the front of the building. And Kitty screamed. She screamed loudly enough to wake people on both sides of the street. There are lights popping on. Uh, there's a large nine-story apartment building called the Mowbray across the street from this building. Uh, of course, it's 3 a.m. People are waking up. Suddenly, lights pop on and off, and people are coming to the windows to see what has occurred. Now, uh, this is a neighborhood where there's a bar on the, on the corner, and there's often a lot of yelling in the middle of the night, uh, but not yelling like this. It was, uh, it was enough to wake, again, dozens, no one can say exactly how many people, but many of them did come to their window, and one of them, a man named Robert Moser, lifted his window. Now, those of you who know this story, of course, know that it's supposed to be all about apathy. The first thing that happened after Kitty's cries rang out through the, uh, through the block, uh, the empty, deserted, street was a man named Moser who lifts his window and yells, leave that girl alone. At that point, the attacker, this man Mosley, fled. He's, he's scared. He's, he's, been, he's been yelled at. He ran around the corner, disappeared. At this point, the groggy people looking out uh, look down and they see a woman alone on the street, a woman who is strong enough still, even though one of her lungs is punctured, uh, by the knife strike through the back uh, to walk around the corner out of sight. Now, at this point, uh, she's no longer visible, at least in the same way she was. I'm going to jump forward from there about a half hour later, 
when uh, the police car finally arrives and uh, finds Kitty Genovese dying. The story is reported in the tabloids, Queen's Woman Stabbed, uh, the next few days. Also in the New York Times, the very next day, a short item, Queen's Woman Stabbed. It was one of more than 600 murders in New York City that year and was not particularly news at the time. Um, it wouldn't be news until the second event that contributed to making this the most notorious crime of its time occurred, and that's 10 days after the crime. Now, people were looking for this killer. There was, there was a certain uh, sensationalism to the way that, uh, that the crime was portrayed, at least in the, in the tabloids, uh, not in the Times. The Times was a very dry account. Uh, but 10 days later, the new metropolitan editor of the New York Times, whose name was uh, Abraham Rosenthal, uh, he had lunch, as he generally did, with one of his sources. It's his job to find out what's going on in the city. He's really determined to change the way the New York Times has covered the city, to strike chords with people, to, to bring emotional stories that really explain what's going on in the city, not just report it. Uh, he had uh, done this again and again, but this is a story that uh, struck him because, uh, well, actually, it didn't strike him yet. He went uh, to speak to the police commissioner who was a fellow named Michael Murphy. They called him, other uh, policemen called him Bull Murphy. And uh, Bull Murphy was very concerned about uh, racial unrest in the city, and for good reason, because it's gonna go uh, through the roof shortly after uh, this crime occurred. He was also concerned about a dueling confession that had happened. This man had been caught in the meantime, caught for a reason I'll tell you a little bit uh, later, an ironic, uh, one of the many ironies of this case. Uh, and he had confessed to three different murders. One of the murders he confessed to happened already have been solved. They had, they had a guy uh, who had also confessed, um, and, and this was an embarrassment to the police department. It throws, it throws a case that, that uh, is a layup to them into doubt, and the other newspapers have started to uh, run a headline, for instance, one in the Daily News that says, uh, uh, two confessions baffle police. Well, now, if you're Commissioner Bull Murphy, you don't like to be presented as baffled in uh, the newspapers. Uh, he didn't want to talk about the two, the dueling confessions. So after they have their lunch, 10 days after the crime, uh, Abraham Rosenthal, he dabs the uh, soup from his, uh, from his chin and says, tell me about those... Uh, those two confessions, what are, what are you going to do about that? And the police commissioner changes the subject. He says, you know, the real story you ought to be looking at is that, uh, that poor girl in Queens, because that's one for the books, 38 witnesses. And Rosenthal hadn't heard that before. What do you, what do you mean, 30, he said, 38 witnesses out there, and they did nothing to help that girl. Now, at this point, if you're a newsman like Rosenthal, you get a charge up and down the back of your neck, because this is a story that may resonate. This is a new interpretation. This is a, this is a look at a, at a horrible crime that isn't about the killer, and it isn't about the victim. It's about the witnesses who, well, they, they didn't do enough, at least according to Commissioner Murphy. Now, Rosenthal instantly went back to the uh, Times building uptown from uh, where they'd had lunch, in fact, he rode in a squad car. Uh, Commissioner Murphy, these, these uh, talks were usually off the record, but Commissioner Murphy was uh, willing enough to uh, let Rosenthal go after this one, that the squad car takes him back to work. He picks out a reporter named Martin Gansberg and says, Martin, go out to Kew Gardens and see what you can find out about this case. Uh, Gansberg, who is an established and a good reporter, uh, spends three days in Kew Gardens talking to neighbors. Some heard something. Uh, and they tell him about that. Uh, he also relies on the police, the detectives who have been combing the neighborhood trying to find out what really happened that night. And three days later, he's ready to report this story. Now, you might think that uh, two weeks after a story that was on the inside of the paper uh, and got the newspaper of record in America and got uh, four paragraphs might not merit front page treatment. but. This one was interpreted differently. This one was interpreted the way A.M. Rosenthal felt that it would have maximum impact, and it sure did. 
Uh, it was interpreted uh, on the front page uh, as a case of apathy, a case in which 38, precisely 38 witnesses, looked out their windows for a half hour as a poor young woman was stabbed to death, and none of them lifted a finger to call the police. None of them tried to help her. Uh, this story, four columns across the uh, front page, and it is instantly national news, given this sort of treatment by the uh, New York Times. Uh, it was uh, a famous first line that pins the blame for the crime, not on the killer, but on the witnesses who watched and did nothing. Uh, the hand-wringing that uh, followed this case not only made the name Kitty Genovese famous as what she would be for the next 50 years, a name, a picture in the paper, this photo, uh, and she would be known solely as a victim. She was the perfect victim for this account, which had a great deal to do with what the newspaper felt was the matter with America at that time, that we are no longer engaged with each other, that we are no longer willing to help each other. This leads to a Mike Wallace radio uh, special on the apathetic American. This leads to a new beat at newspapers across uh, the country, including the Kansas City Star, including the Times for sure, uh, and, and dozens of other newspapers. The apathy beat, in which uh, news stories were sought to, uh, to try to explain what was the matter with us. How on earth could we be so cold-hearted as to let an innocent young woman die while we watched and did absolutely nothing uh, about it. Now, I come to this almost 50 years later, actually 48 years later. I've uh, written before, as uh, you heard, uh, about some interesting parts of America in uh, the last, in relatively modern history. Uh, and I'm always fascinated by a story that suggests it might be somewhat deeper than what we know about it. What we know about this story the story of Kitty Genovese for half a century has been this poor young woman, this poor defenseless young woman in the middle of the night in Kew Gardens, Queens, a place that most of America pictured as a place like Hell's Kitchen. If you remember West Side stories, fire escapes up and down, and, and it was pictured as uh, almost an amphitheater in which for 30 minutes, as the New York Times story said, for more than half an hour, 38 law-abiding, uh, respectable citizens watched a killer stalk and stab a woman three times in three attacks and did nothing to help her. That's the story that I wanted to uh, investigate and see whether there was uh, anything further to it. Partly because, I mean, the mere idea of the, the uniqueness of this event, if you think of us, take 38 of us, put us in our windows, there's a, there's a girl being stabbed outside, and this stabbing is not just momentary. This goes on, as the, as the New York Times reported, to the, to the world's shock for more than 30 minutes. All of these people watching, and again, it's, it's, as, as the report says, the apathy beat carries on, uh, they, they are watching as if on TV, because TV was, was a new problem in America. It's, what's TV doing to us? It's, it's desensitizing us. This was a big part of the interpretation of the Kitty Genovese story. It's making, we're getting used to uh, violence on television. We can always turn the channel like these people did when they finally looked away uh, from their windows. Well, even so, it struck me as, as at least worth looking into whether 38 people really did look out there, and not one, not a single one of them. It's, it, it took almost a conspiracy of apathy. And if you've got any reporter in you, you always get a little suspicious of conspiracies, simply because it's hard to, to uh, make so many people behave the same way. Uh, so I'm, I'm not from Missouri, but you still have to show me. Uh, I spent uh, several months looking into the case, becoming more, more and more fascinated all the time. It starts always, as, as, as books tend to do, you try to read everything you possibly can. There's a lurid biography of the uh, uh, chief of detectives. It's called Chief! Exclamation uh, point. And, and it's got uh, many details. There's, there was a previous book called Twisted Confessions by a prosecutor in this case, Charles Scholar, um, who told about several different murders. One of them was uh, the Kitty Genovese story. Uh, interestingly enough, though, there had not been a book about this case 
since 1964. And it happened to be a, a, an Insti book, one of the very few that were published in, uh, in that time, that came out only three months after the crime. Oddly enough, it wasn't by the reporter who wrote the story. It was by his editor. It was by A.M. Rosenthal, who had such a deep feeling for this, for this tale and thought it explained so much. He had, he had tremendous empathy for Kitty Genovese dying in one of the most awful ways one could imagine. Uh, and, and Rosenthal then comes out with this book. Now, you can imagine how Martin Gansberg, you're the reporter. You're the reporter who, uh, who has won some awards for his, uh, his story, who has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize that he didn't win, um, maybe partly because the uh, New York Times, when, when they uh, nominated the story for a Pulitzer, uh, it, it was not nominated as being written by Martin Gansberg. It was nominated as being by Martin Gansberg and A.M. Rosenthal. This, uh, it's very unusual to have the editor stuck on the uh, Pulitzer application. Um, Rosenthal, the newsroom term is big-footed Martin Gansberg. He took the story and made it his own. He felt it belonged to him. He wrote the book that, uh, that lengthened, that strengthened and promulgated the interpretation that, that nobody questioned. Uh, the the uh, headline, actually, if you ever go back on Google and look at the original headline on the uh, Time story, it says 37 witnesses. And then the first paragraph of the story says 38. Well, that might kind of alert you to this. But the power of the number, I mean, I think it's an instance, historically, it's so much like uh, Senator Joe McCarthy, so, uh, waving, waving blank pieces of paper and say, I know 57 communists in the State Department. Well, if you say that, and if you say 38 witnesses, you, it sounds like you really know what you're talking about. He didn't say 37, he didn't say 39. 38 witnesses was, in fact, the title of A.M. Rosenthal's book, the first book on this case before this book. Oddly enough, for such a famous occurrence that nobody had revisited uh, the case. Uh, after doing my reading, I, I wound up walking the crime scene. You can go there and it looks almost exactly like that today. It's haunting how little has changed in Kew Gardens, which again is, is not like Hell's Kitchen. It's, it's a leafy suburb where uh, people were, were very comfortable uh, walking after, uh, after dark, knew each other's names, knew the neighbors. Um, I spent a good deal of time there. And like another man named uh, Joseph DeMay, he's a uh, lawyer who lives in Kew Gardens, who had a website uh, and started to raise questions about 10 years ago into the Times account of this story. If you're actually there, you wonder how it would play out just geographically. Where, where, did she, where was she at that time? Could, could, they still, could they really see her from that window? If she's back here, where she came around toward the end, as I'll get to shortly, well, obviously, the people in that apartment building on the other side of the building couldn't possibly see her. So since they're among the 38, how can you possibly say that 38 people watched the entirety of the thing for half an hour? Simply walking on this block, which thousands upon thousands of people had done, uh, doing that makes you wonder whether this account was correct. Uh, so the, one of the most pleasant parts of working on a book is always the research. To me, it's, it's much better than the blank page in front of you. Uh, and, and putting the puzzle pieces together. Uh, and, and you know the various challenges. One of the big challenges was the absolute necessity of getting Kitty's partner uh, to talk with me. Now, uh, people did not know, partly because it was covered up at the time, that Kitty was a lesbian. Uh, Kitty was part of the uh, thriving uh, underground gay scene in New York City, where they would go see the folkies in uh, Greenwich Village, and also go to underground uh, gay bars, which were completely illegal, run by the mob, winked at by the police department. Uh, and. Um, the, uh, it, was, it was a dangerous time to be gay, even in Greenwich Village. This is five years before the Stonewall riots. This is a time when Kitty and her partner, who was a woman named Marianne Zelanko, uh, Kitty and her partner didn't hold hands, I mean, even in Greenwich Village, for fear of being beaten up. There are gangs of guys who go out, quote unquote, queer hunting, and they would like to beat you up. Uh, there was a, uh, 
a tall bartender that they both knew who worked in one of these underground bars uh, named Mitch. And Mitch was female, Mitch was six feet tall, uh, Mitch dressed in a suit and tie, and Mitch was beaten to death one night uh, for being Mitch uh, in Greenwich Village. Both Kitty and Marianne knew and mourned her. Uh, one of the strangest things was they would leave Manhattan, get on the train, come back to this neighborhood and feel safe. Uh, this was a safer neighborhood, much less crime than there was. Leads me back to the necessity of my talking with Marianne Zelanko. Sometimes it's hard just to track such people down. Marianne spoke to NPR. She had broken a 45-year, a 40-year silence uh, in 2004. She spoke for a minute with NPR and talked about her memories of this woman she loved. Marianne Zelanko turns out to be a very private person who retreated, who left, left town, never set foot in Kew Gardens again after this crime. And if I'm going to do a good book on this subject, I'm going to need to talk with Marianne. Well, she hadn't talked with anyone else. She spoke briefly to an old uh, Sports Illustrated buddy of mine named Jeff Perlman uh, at the same time she spoke with NPR. But the totality of what she had done, the press she had done in 50 years, uh, amounted to about five minutes worth. I wrote to Marianne. I found out uh, I, I got an address for her. Uh, didn't want to bother her on the phone, at least initially. I wrote letters to her. Uh, and uh, she said she wasn't going to talk to me. I wrote some more letters to her. I sent her my previous books, uh, not looking for much. I, you know, I, I don't want to. I know this is this is a hard thing for you, but if I'm going to tell the story right, if I'm going to do justice to your relationship with Kitty, I, I truly hope that you'll speak with me. Um, we finally talked on the phone a couple times, and Marianne said, "You know, I, I appreciate you wanting to do a good job. I, I can't talk about it." And, and she wept on the telephone. Well, that, that'll make you leave her alone for a while, this, this woman who, who's still mourning her partner from 50 years ago. Um, I wrote her again. Finally, she said she'd be willing to talk. And you, it's a long drive from New York City, but I drove up to where she lives now in Vermont. And uh, we spent many hours at a uh, coffee shop. And I am eternally grateful to uh, Marianne Zelanko for sharing with me uh, her life with Kitty Genovese, which is such a big part of this book. Uh, my goal going in was not to tell just the story of a death, but to tell a story of a life, to try to be a little bit of a remedy to the fact that this woman is a cipher, this woman is a picture, this woman is nothing but a victim, nothing but a name to the vast majority of people who are even familiar with her story. Um, so Marianne helped me understand her better. Uh, we talked on the phone many times. Uh, if you've ever dealt with somebody who, who just isn't a talker, who is about as reserved and as much of a hermit as can possibly be, still a likable person, but, but um, the, uh, the thing that you hear from Marianne Zelanko on the phone uh, more than anything else by far is, gotta go. Uh, she's so eager not to return to this, and it took some real bravery on her part. Uh, that helped fill in a good deal of this story. Um, so landing Marianne was, was awfully important. That also helped me fill in the times, to fill in the scene. I mean, she, she talked about the fear that you have. There's still, if you're walking around the city in 1964, when you see that, that yellow and red sign, remember with the triangles? Uh, that's a fallout shelter. That's where you're going to go when the bombs come. And the bombs might come at any moment. Talk about an edgy period. Uh, not only has the president been assassinated, not only are we going toward a dark, uh, stage of uh, the city's and, and the whole country's experience, but who knows when the bombs are going to come. Uh, Marianne remembers that and, and points out uh, how it felt to live in the city at that time. Uh, that was awfully important. I also, of course, wanted to reach the killer, who is still alive. Fifty years later, he's, he was uh, actually Kitty Genovese's age. She was 28. He's now 79. Maximum security prison uh, in uh, Danamora. It's called Clinton Collect Correctional Facility. Not the very uh, kind of place that uh, you'd want to spend a minute, much less 50 years. Um, it's an interesting part of the writing process to try to get in touch with a, a guy who's uh, uh, in prison for life. What you have to do is write him. I've got his convict number. I sent him a bunch of, a bunch of letters. I wanted to look him in the eye. Uh, and, and find out who he was and what he would say. Um, 
and he wouldn't talk with me. Uh, I sent him other books. You know, these are your calling cards. Okay, here, here's some books. Maybe uh, they're, they make, uh, they're good for re-gifting, if nothing else. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, if you're going to send somebody books in prison, you have to get new books, and they have to be wrapped in cellophane, because you don't want contraband or a file stuck inside uh, your books. Um, he, I, I got, also got a post office box, because I didn't really want Winston Mosley, the... Who had, who, had killed a, who had killed a young black woman and gotten no attention for it uh, about 10 days before he, he killed Kitty. Uh, if he was going to write to me, I wanted it to be in a post office box. Um, finally, uh, he, he refused to talk with me. Uh, he's refused to talk to any press since he did uh, ABC 2020 uh, 15 or more years ago. Uh, he didn't like the way he was treated because uh, they ignored the fact that uh, he had become uh, behind bars uh, uh, he'd earned a college degree and, and become uh, what he considered a, uh, uh, an asset, a potential asset to society. Around that time, he wrote a letter to the editor, to the New York Times, uh, saying that uh, what he'd done in the long run was a service to society because he had alerted society to the fact that people need to come to the aid of uh, their fellows when, uh, when they really need help. Uh, he also pointed out that uh, something like this, you know, it's, it's horrible for the victim for a few minutes, but for me, when you get caught, we're talking about the rest of your life. So that's another difficulty for uh, Winston Mosley, one of the most chilling people you will ever know. Part of my research was to go through the Queens District Attorney's Office uh, and speak to uh, Assistant DA Charles Testagrossa, who was also responsible for uh, keeping David Berkowitz, the son of Sam in prison, and who told me that he considers Mosley a much more dangerous sort of predator than the Son of Sam ever thought of being. Uh, it was Tester Grossa who introduced me to one of the people who was the most important uh, to making this book happen, and she's a young woman named Janine Abel. She's a paralegal, uh, and those of you who, who know or may be or, or live with, uh, say, nurses uh, or paralegals know that uh, that uh, it's the doctors and the DAs who, who uh, kind of get to swan their way through and make a few speeches and get the glory while the paralegals and the nurses do the hard work. Uh, Janine Abel, uh, her, the biggest part of her job is to, to put together a parole letter every two years when this man comes up for parole. He wants, to, he wants parole. Uh, and the DA's office always sends a letter uh, very carefully crafted. Uh, and. Janine would try to make it better every time, saying these are the reasons this man should not be let out of prison. Uh, and um, as part of her work, um, as has happened with a lot of people, uh, partly because of this, this hypnotic photo of Kitty, partly because of the defenselessness of her, and, and I hope partly because they, people knew a little bit about her, what a, what a likable, uh, generous, hardworking person she was, fast driving too. Um, wanted to know a little bit about her. Janine had made the pilgrimage to Kitty's grave just to pay her respects before going back to work on the next uh, uh, parole letter. And what Janine did was do so much work for me that, uh, that she, uh, this book could not have been nearly as good as it is, uh, to the degree that it, uh, that it is good. Um, one day she called me and said, well, I think I've got what, uh, what we've both been looking for. Uh, and I went back out to, uh, to Queens, to the DA's office, and we walked into a conference room. And if you're a writer, this is, this is one of the eureka moments. This is one of the best moments you will ever have in your life, and you will never forget a row of 12 cardboard boxes full of documents, trial documents, psychiatric reports, the tr court transcripts, uh, that had not been seen for a decade or more, maybe 20 years. And we, we plowed through all those, and they constitute a good deal of the research in this. I've, um, they're, they're, I don't know if you, if you happen to see, there's an AP story that just went out today talking about a good deal of, of revisionism going on in the Kitty Genovese case, um, and some doubts have been cast. Well, the backup is here. If you, if you, uh, uh, if you, spend some time in journalism and, and make an assertion, you need to be able to back it up. That's what Janine provided for me, the ability to back up everything that's in this book 
uh, with material that has been unknown for 50 years. And uh, she, too, uh, is somebody I will uh, owe a debt for uh, the longest time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank uh, you. You can't write a book like this without real help. So, so much of it is trying to just get across your sincerity and trying to tell the story as well as you can, and then you count on people who help you. Uh, there's an academic uh, specialist named Dr. Harold Takushian, the premier academic authority on the, this case, who uh, comes in for a lot of help uh, as well. But it's time to talk a little bit about the writing of the book, having put together uh, boxes of files and, and then trying to be as organized as my wife tries to encourage me to be rather than well, there's a box of files, and I know, I know that transcript is in there somewhere. Uh, it's, oh, this one is green, and that one is blue, and, and this one has a third cut file folder. And eventually, if you can put your hand on what you need, it does make that writing process simpler. But there are great challenges, I felt, in telling this story. Not only is the end of the story familiar, the, the heroine is going to die an awful death. Uh, and that, that's the central part of the story. Do you begin there? Do you, do you hold it and, and wait? Uh, all you want to do is elucidate what happened for the reader and, may, and do it as effectively as you can. Um, I decided on a particular strategy uh, of presenting this material um, that I'll at least touch on uh, a little bit later. And uh, the other question is how graphic do you want to be? This is, this is a gruesome crime. Uh, this man. Uh, heartlessly uh, did things that, uh, that one can't imagine uh, doing to another human being. So the question is, how do you handle that in a book? This, this isn't something that should, that should give people nightmares for the rest of their lives. You try to find a context. So that was another real challenge in, in trying to tell this, this story well. Uh, and finally, uh, finishing there were still, there's still some holes in, in the research. Uh, and, I, and, and still, you know, I, I'm still trying to get Mosley to talk to me, and he will not. So uh, there is another place that I'm not going to tell anybody one of these days, maybe. Uh, another remarkable place to find some documents uh, that are not only uh, helpful about Winston Mosley. I wound up finding, well, there are, here's a difficult job if you're a, psychiatrist working for the state, you're a court-appointed psychiatrist, you interview this man to try to determine whether he's crazy or not. And uh, in the course of uh, one of those interviews in which he described very dispassionately what he had done that night, uh, one of the psychiatrists walked out to the, uh, uh, I take it back, it was one of the, uh, the lawyers taking down the, the uh, testimony uh, with the psychiatrist, uh, put down his notebook, walked out uh, of, uh, the building went out to the curb and vomited in the street. Uh, this is a uh, chilling character, and I wound up uh, holding another one of those documents that you can't believe you have, which is his junior high school essay, What I Want to Be When I Grow Up. Uh, he was uh, entranced by animals. He, uh, uh, this, this is a man who held a steady job. He was married to a nurse. Fortunately uh, for him, she worked nights so that he could go out hunting for victims in the middle of the night. Uh, he had an ant farm. He was fascinated by all insects. He also liked dogs much better than, uh, uh, than people. He had uh, five German shepherds living in his house, including a vicious one that had bitten several people named Wolfie. Wolfie slept under the bed. Not a household uh, that you want to be in. Uh, and I also managed to get another one of those things that uh, uh, you never forget, which is an old wrinkly reel-to-reel -reel tape. Uh, magnetic tape recording of his voice. And it's the most chilling thing you ever heard. He, it's a very soft voice. Anybody who remembers the, the soft, sweet voice of Nat King Cole, he sounds a little bit like that if Nat King Cole were a robot. If, if Nat King Cole just, just that, that tone is just deadly, deathly, and affectless. So uh, I had that to be able to talk about uh, as well. Um, and finally, in that last uh, trove of uh, documents, uh, it, it's been one of the mysteries of this case. Where did the number 38 come from? The uh, police commissioner gave it to Abe Rosenthal. Uh, but Martin Gansberg, who wrote the story, didn't find. He counted 33. Uh, there were uh, other reports that, uh, that were above 
uh, 38, some that uh, were quite a bit below. And nobody has known the 38 other than that it came from the police department. And I found a document. It was, uh, it was a roundup, a collection of the initial detectives' interviews with the witnesses. And it was handed up, is the term, to the district attorney uh, five days after, I take it back, seven days after the crime, dated uh, March the 20th. And uh, remarkable to see, and I'm counting down, well, there are 49 witnesses listed. Now, even that, that's a little arbitrary because uh, uh, I knew several people who had, had witnessed, had heard, or seen something that happened that night, uh, and they were not listed here. So, well, it's, in that way, it's 49 or somewhat more than 49, but this is not helping me find the 38 until you count the entries, because some of these, some of these interviews that the police did are in an apartment with three people. Three people are talking to you. Well, they put them in one entry. Okay, count them up. Okay, and I, I swear to you, I counted this number 15 times before I said, it's 38. There were 38 entries on this document that was, that was the, the collection handed up to the upstairs. Uh, and I believe that that's the document, uh, that, that there was some hardworking civil servant who counted up the entries, gave that number to Police Commissioner Murphy, who gave it to uh, A.M. Rosenthal, and it entered American history uh, ever after. Um, it's about as arbitrary as can be. You might as well have taken it uh, and pulled it out of, uh, out of uh, your hat. Um, I have a lot to say in the, in the book about uh, how many witnesses, and, they, and we're talking about ear witnesses and eyewitnesses. Some saw and heard, some only heard, some uh, heard a little bit of something and were totally confused. Some were cowardly. Some could have helped Kitty and they didn't. Uh, many were, were confused and many were just terrified. Also in those days, you can't call 911. Uh, you call the, the dispatcher who connects you to somebody else. You may be talking to a desk sergeant or a, a communications officer who as likely as not to invite you to uh, mind your own business. Let us fight crime, and if you don't like the neighborhood, go somewhere else. That happened uh, quite a bit. Um, the, um, I'm going to uh, jump forward a bit uh, to the point at which I feel that I have told the story as it really happened. And, and here is what really happened. It's 3.15 uh, in the morning, and Kitty is on the other side of this building when she gets out of her car and locks it. She tries to run when she hears there's a man running after her. He catches her and stabs her in the back twice. She screams. The window opens across the, uh, in the Mowbray apartment building. Leave that girl alone. Mosley runs around the corner into the darkness. He actually sat in his car. He thought his car was uh, uh, too conspicuous. He backed his car into the darkness and waited to see what would happen. Had Kitty stayed where she was, she could have been seen by all of these people on both sides of the street, looking out their windows, groggily, it's, it's cold, it, it, some may not know what's going on, but if she were to stay there, somebody's gonna get her some help. But what is, what is she thinking? You've been stabbed in the middle of the night. This is a, what's a more primitive human terror than you're out alone at night by yourself and, and the, a monster springs out and, and attacks you. Uh, what must have been in Kitty's mind was to get home. And this is her, her door. It's just barely out of the picture, right here. You go upstairs and that's where Marianne was sleeping. Marianne hadn't worked a double shift and she's sleeping that night. Kitty manages to come around this corner. Now, as she rounds this corner where you can see the car down there, she becomes invisible to the people looking on both sides of Austin Street. She can't make it. She doesn't have the strength to get to her apartment, to the door that leads to her apartment. At that first doormat there, she enters uh, the uh, entryway that leads upstairs to the apartment of a friend named Carl Ross. Carl Ross was a timid guy. Uh, as Marianne told me later, if you needed help, he'd be the last guy you'd want to be at the top of the stairs. Kitty fell in there and must have felt safe. And this is one of the most heartbreaking things to contemplate uh, of the whole story. This is only a few minutes after she'd first been attacked. She must have felt safe. She had tried a, a couple of other doors. She fell through this door and she lay at the bottom of the stairs. The stairs lead up to Carl Ross's door. And she must have felt she can wait there. She is not fatally injured at this point. She waits, Mosley waits. Mosley is sitting in his car 
and people who looked out the window look out and there's nothing to see. There was one uh, young man named Michael Hoffman who swears that his father did call the police. Uh, Michael Hoffman woke his dad up and said, oh, just look at that girl out there, Mosley is gone. Uh, Samuel Hoffman comes out and looks out the window and sees Kitty down there, calls the police. Uh, I cannot prove this, but I have a sworn affidavit to that effect from young man Michael Hoffman. My dad called the police, said there's a girl staggering around out there, you better send a police car. Well, he's on hold, he's on hold, nothing happens. Now, the street is deserted, the street is empty. Uh, the next day, by the way, Michael Hoffman uh, will uh, watch his dad tell the policemen who show up, uh, why weren't you there last night? And uh, the policemen tell him uh, that we're not going to need you. Uh, uh, you know, we've got enough, and they just gave him a dirty look. Now, if you wonder what kind of a witness Michael Hoffman might be, you never know it's whether a witness is reliable or unreliable. He did wind up, uh, uh, when he grew up, he did go into law enforcement and spend, uh, spent his career as a New York City police lieutenant. Uh, that's one of the witnesses. Uh, there is another, and I don't want to give it away. Toward the end of the book, there is a moment of what I consider real heroism by one of Kitty's neighbors. Kitty has always been believed to die alone, but I can tell you that she did not die alone. I can also tell you, to make it uh, somewhat brief, Mosley came back and attacked her again. This is what killed her. He found her in there. Imagine her horror. He has tried the coffee shop door locked. He's tried the, rail the railroad station door locked. He finds her in there and, as he put it later, finished what he set out to do uh, in horrific fashion. Uh, and at one point he heard, he heard a door creak upstairs. And he looked up and he is face to face, eye to eye, with Carl Ross, who looks down at him and shuts the door. Uh, this, this is the witness who could have helped Kitty and did not. I would not claim ever that I would be a guy who, if I see someone being stabbed, that I'm going to rush in and take on the guy with the knife. But what you've got to do is call the police. He didn't. He was asked later by the police why he didn't call. And he said famously, I didn't want to get involved. That becomes the slogan of apathy as the way this story is told uh, forever after. Um, I want to, how are we on time? I'm about uh, five minutes from, uh, that sounds good. Uh, the book comes out um, about a week ago. Uh, there have been uh, some fascinating uh, uh, things. You know, once you go out and get a chance to talk to people about your book, that's a uh, uh, remarkable uh, and fascinating uh, process always. Uh, and and when, you t when you talk to people uh, on the radio or on television, it's always such a great thrill when they've actually read the book. Um, the, uh, one thing that happened, uh, though, was finding out that this position of mine is still very threatening to some people who uh, prefer the original uh, interpretation of the story. Uh, and I was at a conference at uh, Fordham, the 50th anniversary Genovese Memorial Conference. Uh, and, and I think there's a reason for that. I think portraying Kitty as an urban martyr, representing uh, urban apathy, it's led to a lot of good sociology, a lot of the things that had positive effects. Uh, as Crosby alluded to before, it led to the 911 uh, emergency phone system, the outcry from this. Understanding of the bystander effect, which is a true thing. Uh, if, you're, if you're being attacked, you're a lot better off if there are only two or three people watching you than 20 or 30. And the reason is, if they're 20 or 30, everybody waits for somebody else to go first. There's somebody stronger, somebody braver than I am, and people tend not to act at all. Um, and one odd moment that happened, the, the book has gotten quite a bit of attention, for which I'm, I'm grateful, a long story in the New Yorker recently, uh, that, uh, and because, you know, if, if you spend so much time and effort and you believe in, in what you're doing, you just want people to come to the book and make their own decisions about it. Uh, but there was a moment when a, a literary agent I know uh, was telling me that he had dinner the other night and the story came up. Uh, and somebody said, you know, that, it's that Kitty Genovese story. It's 50 years later, it's, it's become this big controversy. And he said, well, well tell me what, uh, you, uh, you, how you understand it. What's controversial about it? And his, his friend said, well, for all this time, we've been told that, that uh, none, 38 women, none of them ever called the police. But you know, it turns out 
that they all called the police. <laughs> well, it's not quite my point, but uh, you do see how stories can, can stick in uh, strange ways. Um, uh, the last thing I wanted to do is just briefly, uh, I hope this illustrates my attempt, rather than to uh, deal in numbers and say how many people did this or that, I wanted to try to suggest what it was like to be one of those people in Kew Gardens awakened by Kitty's cries that night. This is a very brief selection. Um, and if you imagine it's three in the morning, uh, you're sound asleep, and you hear some blood-curdling screams from a street uh, right outside your window. You heard her cry out, not the words maybe, though the words were loud. Oh God, he stabbed me, help me. But you'd been asleep, your windows were shut against the cold. It's three in the morning, for God's sake. The sheer shrill sound, though, you couldn't miss that. Her shouts were loud enough to wake people on both sides of the street. So maybe you get up too. Maybe you pad to the window in the dark to see why somebody on Austin Street is screaming bloody murder. Do you call the police? About a girl shouting? They laugh. 20 to 1, it's nothing. A lover's spat. A wife or girlfriend getting smacked, which is a lousy thing, but not exactly news in Kew Gardens an hour after last call at Bailey's Pub. Except that this isn't regular pissed off drunk hollering. This is panic. Help me. On the sidewalk outside the bookshop, a man bent over a girl. See him? She's on her knees doing what? Trying to get up. It's hard to tell looking through a smudged window in the bare branches of the pin oaks and sycamores lining the street. Somebody yells, leave that girl alone. More lights pop on up and down the block. The girl and her attacker, if that's what he is, are alone on the sidewalk under a street lamp, visible to dozens of bleary-eyed people in the nine-floor Mowbray apartments on one side of the street and the faux Tudor apartment building on the other. Somebody must have called the cops by now. And look, the guy's leaving, slipping into the dark, leaving the girl behind. She gets up, not screaming now. She gets up and walks past the shuttered TV radio store, stepping slowly, but not like a drunk, more like sleepwalking, one wobbly step after another, like she's in a dream. She walks to the corner of the Tudor building, goes under the drugstore sign, and then around the corner, out of sight. It's quiet, a minute goes by, Windows going dark on both sides of the street. There's no sign anything happened. Just a few dark spots on the sidewalk that might have been there before. Five more minutes pass. All over, nothing more to see. Until he comes back. The same man, with a hat on now, a fedora with a feather in the brim. He strolls past the railroad station to the Tudor building, looking in doorways like he's left something behind. Trailing the girl around a corner, carrying something in his hand. Looking for her? It's so hard to see. Your phone's right there. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, uh, we don't have a microphone tonight, so if you stand up with your question, and Kevin, if you repeat it, if it sounds like I, not everybody hears. Sure. When you were going through the materials, what evidence, if any, did you find indicating that this person got to a point where he was capable and interested in implementing the murder of individuals? Well, it was, it was really interesting. He was a burglar for a long time. He had a, he had a father who ran a, uh, a uh, TV repair uh, shop in uh, Queens. At an interesting time, you realize that he just changed from radio repair because TV was the coming thing, and you made so much more money repairing TVs. Winston Mosley started by stealing TVs and taking them to his father uh, to resell. But as time passed, and he was, this was a very meticulous man about his, about his looks, very slim, uh, very intelligent, 132 IQ, as they've tested him afterward. Uh, he went from burglary uh, to rape. He was uh, oddly obsessed uh, with women uh, and, and unhappy with his wife, even though he called her the nurse, uh, his perfect wife. He wound up, as time passed, and this accelerated over early, uh, late 1963 and early 64, uh, going out prowling and looking at women. He, he raped them uh, at 
knife point, using a screwdriver sometimes, but it wasn't enough. I mean, this is, this is uh, a person who's looking for some sort of answer that probably doesn't exist in the world, but, but it is ratcheting upward and upward. Uh, shortly before he killed Kitty, uh, he killed a poor woman named Anna Mae Mosley. Uh, I'm sorry, Anna Mae Johnson. Uh, and um, uh, the details of that crime are as unsettling almost as, as of Kitty's. Uh, and he didn't get caught for it. He didn't get much attention for it. Annie Mae Johnson was black. Uh, there was no outcry. And Annie Mae Johnson is practically forgotten uh, today while Kitty's name is uh, still talked about. He frankly went out finally again in an odd moment of trying to ratchet his crime up more. Tonight I'm going to kill a white girl. And uh, that's what he set out to do. He still had enough logic in him to be willing to give up. He cruised looking around and uh, was about to give up and go home uh, when he happened to see Kitty getting into a car outside the bar. And it sticks with me to think, had she worked another 10 minutes, had she left her keys in the bar, had the traffic lights changed, their paths never cross. And uh, uh, it's, the dedication of the book is, is to Kitty. I mean, he's still around. This woman has been gone since 1964, and she might have celebrated her 79th birthday later this year. Um, sure, I'll do the, we'll move backward. No, go, go, please. Okay, so after the big story come out from the Times, all these witnesses, right. how did the neighborhood react to being portrayed as unfeeling, ungiving, not willing to look out after a neighbor? Well, not well. It's tarred the reputation. And even today, if you live in Kew Gardens, which is a teensy little community, five blocks each way, say, oh, I'm from Kew Gardens, often as not, people will say, oh, oh that's, that's where they ignored that poor girl who was getting killed. A lot of people moved out. Marianne moved out. Carl Ross moved out, made himself scarce forever. Um, and, uh, but people who stayed, and some of the neighbors that I've spoken to, they still, they still feel that they were done wrong. Uh, by not only uh, the Times, but as soon as that Times story came out, I mean, for 10 days, people are trying, oh, let's find the killer, and wasn't it an awful thing? Well, then suddenly, we're the worst community. We represent cold-hearted horror worldwide. And, and not only, and this is, it's funny to think, uh, in, in a way that it can be, not only are the reporters just swarming from all other papers, swarming the place, knocking on doors, but psychologists are showing up because they want to study this, this, this phenomenon of apathy. So after you talk to the reporter, and then you've got the shrink knocking on your door uh, to see what's, what's going on. And one of the neighbors, a wonderful man named Murray Berger, said uh, that after this became a national story, he would, he would wait up at night, and if he heard a twig break outside, run outside, does someone need help? Uh, <laughs> just trying, trying to make Kew Gardens. Um, so uh, yes, it's been very tough on the reputation of that. Uh, let's go back there. Right? Yep. And one of the topics that the doctor and I spoke about over lunch was about um, well known uh, but little publicized homicides where there had been botched post Oh, that's Annie Mae Johnson. And so he was the one who brought up the Annie Mae Johnson case to me. Mm -hmm. Hmm. The part that was really pertinent to what had happened in this uh, episode about the homicide, about stab wounds versus mm -hmm. gunshots. But also, when I received that package from the DA's office back there, there was probably at least 50 pages that were attached at the conclusion of the Johnson file that should not have come with it and that had to do with Kitty's case. I wish I'd known you when I started working on this book. <laughs> and one of the things that I never will forget in reading it, and I'm sure you probably read it going through all these boxes that they made available to you, was a memo 
from one of the investigating detectives, and I can't remember the date now because I don't remember mm -hmm. how what the proximity was from the date of the memo to when the crime occurred, but I never will forget this detective put on there. They didn't he didn't put the initials AM, mm -hmm. but he simply stated Rosenthal is a better newspaper man than to have not checked out the fact that Mosley had left the victim for quite some time in return. Mm -hmm. And so basically he was saying that because of the fact that that uh, when uh, uh, when Murphy, the commissioner, mm -hmm. put this out to Rosenthal, yeah, this was like great for a reporter to be able to mm -hmm. say, well, I'm going to run with this. But Rosenthal should have checked that out to see because that certainly would have changed the whole dynamics. It's still a horrible, terrible crime, but at least like you described earlier, would not have gotten this out, that this was like a coliseum of everybody watching a 35-minute assault on that poor woman. That's exactly right. You know, I, I, I was in my early teens, and I lived in Brooklyn, and oh. things happened, and it wasn't much, I think TV news was still in 15 minutes, and I don't right. know pages, but the talk on the street for the longest time was, and, and, and I believe it started for a, for a long time, that he was a boyfriend. He beat her up, he beat her to death, maybe stabbed her, and when people were yelling at the window, he yelled back, get back to your house. That's the story, I, that was the story on the street. Wow. And, you know, and that was the older guys who were probably 20, but right. that was for the longest time. And the name Genevieve, where I lived in Brooklyn, that's what people were saying, because they connected her right away from mom. And, sure. And so that was so, and but I heard that, and I believed that for a long time. Huh. And, it's remarkable, the stuff that sticks to this story. I well, just it, wanted to put mm -hmm. another question. Did he try to sexually assault her, or did he just murder her? He sure did, yes. Yeah. He, uh, this, this is a man whose method at that point was uh, to, to uh, murder and rape people in that order. Uh, but uh, it's true that the, Gen the name Genevieve is, is no bargain. And uh, Kitty, uh, she actually, this is a fascinating thing. This famous photo is a mugshot. Uh, that Kitty was, she, you work in a bar, and one of the services you provide is somebody wants to bet a couple dollars on the ponies, you'll take their bet for them. It's a lot less, you know, less of a predatory thing than the state now does selling you uh, scratchers. Uh, but, but Kitty would, and, and, she, and the NYPD went to the trouble of staking out two bars, one where a friend of hers worked and her own, so that, and then they arrest her for booking these, these little bets on the horses. And what she said to them was, you know, why are you after me? And they said, we know you're a part of a big criminal operation. <laughs> and and she, she finally, I mean, to, to her credit, she got a little annoyed at him. And she said, oh, yeah, you're right. I take in thousands, and I take 5%. Uh, and then she wound up um, paying a $50 fine. But it cost her her job, another bizarre circumstance, had that not happened, maybe she stays in the bar where she was working at the time and not at the bar where she was working the night she comes out after work and he drives past and sees her. Sure. Uh, which crime or crimes put him in prison? And what happened to the dueling confessions? Uh, the dueling confessions were ignored. Uh, they wound up not, not trying Mosley uh, for the one, and they had the real killer of the previous one. Mosley, fascinatingly enough, was captured not for murder but for burglary a few days uh, after, uh, I mean, and after he killed Kitty, he, it's, it's 3 in the morning, he's up and off to work at uh, 7.30 as usual the next day. Uh, but uh, not long after the crime, less than, a, I think it was just under a week, uh, he was stealing a TV. He was going back to his, to his old tricks, first time he did anything in the daytime, uh, stealing a TV from a house and he's putting it in his trunk of his car. And a concerned neighbor says, why are you putting my neighbor's TV in your car? Yeah. And Winston Mosley said, I'm helping them move. Well, so the, the neighbor calls up and he says, hey, banisters, and, uh, are you, you're not moving. No, we're not. This man calls the police. Police come by, pick him up for burglary. Uh, and then before long, after confessing to burglary, he starts confessing to murder. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Uh -huh. Uh, who owned the ant farm? That was Mosley. He was. Uh, he did own an ant farm, 
And uh, he was also fascinated. He knew insect behavior pretty well. I talked to a defense attorney, very colorful, Barry Rhodes of Brooklyn, uh, who represented him in a, one of his pointless uh, appeals. And uh, Rhodes is talking with Winston Mosley in a prison library one day, and a cockroach runs by him. And the lawyer, Rhodes, goes, goes to step on the cockroach, and it, 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 he missed. And he said, you know, somehow they know that you're trying to step on them. And Winston Mosley says, no, no, they, uh, they have uh, cilia. They have little hairs on their bodies that can sense the shift in the air current. And uh, the lawyer goes and looks it up, and he's absolutely right. Um, Did you say on the radio today that he, got out, he broke out of prison? Or? Uh, yes, he broke out of Attica uh, four years after this crime. I happen to be somebody who doesn't think that the government should be able to kill people. Um, but if you are for the death penalty, uh, this is the case for you. He was sentenced to a die in the electric chair. That was overturned on appeal. He then escaped. And you don't know, want to know how he managed to get himself in the hospital. Uh, it's, it's one of the odder uh, events. Of the, he escaped while being transferred from the hospital back to Attica and uh, went on a crime spree in Buffalo, uh, raped two more women in 1968 in Buffalo before he went back, uh, back inside. Curious to know what her uh, remaining siblings uh, feel about the work you've done, and also, uh, do you know of any uh, networks uh, nationally that might be doing something to document this 50th anniversary of hers? Um, as far as networks, television. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the first one, the the family keeps its its collective head down. They have not. They never went to the trial. It was just too traumatic for them. They they don't talk very often. They went to one parole hearing. But she has a brother. Kitty has a brother named Bill Genovese, uh, who tells me um, and he was so determined to try to help people. He went to Vietnam at the age of 19, and got his legs blown off. Uh, he's, he's in a wheelchair now and has been ever since. Um, he did not talk with me for the book other than very briefly because he's working on a documentary with a fellow named uh, James Solomon they've been working on for 10 years. I've seen a clip and it's, it's very moving. Um, they expect the documentary, which is called The Witness, to come out um, maybe later this year. Um, who's back in the back? Well, it's, it's certainly hard to say for sure, but I definitely feel that that's part of what made it a, a sensation. They, you know, they didn't identify, the Times at that time did not identify people by race, but they did, you know, there were pictures in all the papers, and, and that sort of black on white crime has, has always seemed to ratchet up popular interest and attention in a story. Yeah. Right. In the face of such right. danger, I guess. Um, do you think, as opposed to now, or I guess now as opposed to 1964, more people are, people are likely to get involved because of cell phones and stuff like that? I mean, as far as you're Yeah, I hope so. I mean, there's still these terrible stories where people walk past uh, somebody lying in the street and just take a picture. The and, and man, Yes, uh, right. Uh, and then here in Kansas City, the policeman and the firemen, um, and, and people are just watching. And Kitty's name is always evoked in those times. But there also is a lot of heroism. And it does make it easier to you know, take a picture, uh, call 911. Uh, so I, you know, I think there's a spectrum. Uh, but, but I do think there is, is maybe more heroism. And one of the most inspiring stories that, that I heard working on this case was that of Captain Chesley Sullenberger who uh, knew of the Kitty Genovese story when he was a, uh, in junior high school in Denison, Texas, read about the Kitty Genovese story, and as he puts it, he vowed at that time if he ever had a chance to take action and save somebody's life, he was going to do it. Well, he lands that plane in the Hudson, and, and he, afterward, he's out on, the, out on the wing with the people waiting you know, on, the, on the wing of the floating plane, and sees boats coming 
from both sides, but he's looking at the New York side, and he's looking at the Manhattan side, and here come these boats, and he said he felt something had changed in, the, in New York in, the, in those 48 years. Yes, ma'am. I tried and tried and tried, and the man has made himself scarce. Uh, he moved out very shortly after, uh, after the crime, has probably changed his name, but that, as much as, I mean, I would dearly love to look him in the eye. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, I think he was afraid. He was drunk. The first thing you, at those, in those days, you call the police, the first thing they want to know is who you are, they don't, not where is your emergency. Uh, he was drunk. He was gay. You don't like the police very much because they don't like you. Um, so I think uh, there's reason to, to have some sympathy for, for his terror, but not for his failure to overcome it, pick up the phone, and try to get his friend some help. Yeah. Well, they need to be remembered too. Yeah, they, they well, it's it's one thing to think about, uh, and and it's it's no insult to Kitty to wonder. I think, were she not so attractive? Were she older? Were she heavy? Were she black? Does the story stay the way that it has? And I think that's that's uh, a question that I sure can't answer. But uh, but it's it's worth wondering about uh, uh, just the way that. Uh, the press and uh, and collective memory work. Yeah. Okay, sure. In my opinion, not being really a sexual act, do we know what his sexual orientation was? Were there signs of issues with uh, women in his family? Yes, he was he was straight, but not very good at it. Um, <laughs> he he had sexual problems. He also, you know, if you want to complete the the profile on that person. There is a theory that uh, among the people who studied him that he, he was attracted to the scent of menstrual blood. Uh, and this, this, is, uh, this is a man who uh, still tries to get out of prison every couple of years and uh, considers himself a potential asset to uh, the rest of society. Yeah. Um, I knew that, that we were coming up on, on uh, 50 years. It was, it was really that way because I thought, how can it possibly have been 50 years? Uh, and, and it is a, a, an essential New York story. Uh, and just on first thinking about it, there was a certain fishiness to me to the idea that unanimously 38 people would, would watch through their windows for 30 minutes uh, while this went on. Uh, and again, as you, as you peel the onion, each, each layer just, just gets deeper and more interesting uh, uh, and more fascinating. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, I, I wanted very much to, to tell about this young woman's life uh, because uh, she, you know, she had her whole life ahead of her and she was in many ways uh, a really interesting person who deserves to be more than that picture. Thank you very much, well, Kevin, for this. Well, thank you. Thank you.